don't care how good you are in anything, you don't have discipline. You ain't nobody. Right. You're nothing without discipline. Because you give up on the slightest struggle without discipline. Discipline is doing what you hate to do, but do it like you love it. Hey everybody, I am here with Ron Thomas. He's a buddy of mine I've known for many years from BMX to sadly BMX shows <laughs> to, to uh, business. Uh, we also are investing in a commercial real estate project together. Um, Ron's been in the real estate game for many years. I thought he'd be fun to have on. How are you, Ron? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Good, good. So getting right into it. Let's talk about the most important thing, the bike. I'm just kidding. Not bike <laughs> show. We're not going to start there. Let's start with BMX because there's actually some fun memories there. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yes. Yes. So with so with BMX riding, you got into it. How young were you when you got into BMX riding? Uh, like 11 years old, probably. Yeah. What 11 about you? years old. And then, so Ron was really good. Um, you rode for what company? You rode for Levi's at one point. I did right? for a while. Yeah. 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 So Ron was traveling around doing did, did shows too, and I think a fun uh, fun story to talk about would be the difference in you and all the other people when you were doing shows. But you told me once, um, <laughs> did you say how did that go? You had uh, some books with you, and people were uh, like, "What's wrong with you?" So I was traveling, uh, you know, making a hundred dollars a day, um, about two days a week, right, to go on the <laughs> road to to do these bike shows. Gross. <laughs> of course right of course get out of the dumpster but anyway we're traveling and we're doing these bike shows and i'm right out of high school i just dropped out of college and i'm like yeah there's something more to the world maybe than bike riding but nobody else in on tour really thought that way and so they'd be reading bmx plus magazine and all these publications for that industry and i bought mutual funds for dummies i didn't know anything about investing or whatever and so i'd sit in the back of the suburban driving across the country reading mutual funds for dummies you can imagine the shit that I got from the people I do work with for doing something so silly. In in BMX, it's 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 funny. It's like um, it's the one sport where you probably have plenty enough time to learn something else, uh, find a different career, and really you need one because you're not <laughs> you know like a ton of money riding bike. Like yes, there's a couple people up top who do make some money, but for the most part, like if you're a run of the mill show rider uh even top 10 park rider whatever you're not going to make a ton of money most of the time so like you should probably pick up a craft and then people are kind of like laughing at you about that and it's funny to watch all the years later like you're the one who got into a business uh you were you actually made money in the bike show team world so for you for those that don't know because i never talk about this on here is that i had a bmx show team and Ron had one before me, and I bought some ramps from Ron. That was really not nice of you to do that to me. <laughs> uh, and so basically, the, the bike show industry is is uh, probably one of the toughest uh, forms of business possible, but you did it pretty successfully for a while. Um, so I, how, did the, how did you get into that part? Why did you go into bike shows? OK, <laughs> I'll start there. Um, <laughs> Because like most people that are young, I was naive and stupid and <laughs> chasing ambitions that didn't must pass, you know, just dogs didn't know at the end of the day. But anyway, I uh, I thought when I was a kid, I liked riding bikes because it was fun. It would be great to do something that's fun for a living. I didn't understand at the time that once you do something for a living, it might take fun out of it. But anyway, it's like I'll 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 try to build a company that uh, that does these events that I was performing in for $200 a week gross or whatever they were talking about earlier. So that's, that's how that started. Actually, it started a little bit. So we had this heavy equipment that we would carry in and out of these schools where we would do performances. Um, and it was just miserable. And I, I had a background in building things. And I thought, well, I could build equipment that's better than this. So I went to the owner of the company at the time, my boss, and I said, hey, if it would make our lives a lot easier if I could just build new equipment that would, you know, make everything run smoother. And he told me to pound sand, more or less. And I said, that's fine. Um, and so I invested my life savings, like 10 grand in <laughs> building my own equipment. And then I started my, thus began my, my bike joke. Yeah. That's, so I got into it because I didn't know better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's also the interesting thing about, and that's why I also say like, there's so many people who will be like, I'm a grunt. I, I work on cars. I weld, I do something. And Ron's also a person who works on, you know, he's a great welder. I was a mechanic and a roofer, like once again, it's like, it doesn't mean that's the job you have to do forever, but it can also lead you into your next business. Um, 
but looking at the show team so one thing that you you did do incredibly well is build ramps the ramps that you built were amazing um the what you put into it the different designs that you started to build they were a lot easier to use uh, i remember getting the ramps from you and sending you a message like a day or two later like are you serious <laughs> like because i remember like it it would take we had a show team. I used to run a show team, uh, Maximum Velocity, many years ago. Who wanted to put the ramps together? It was five people. Yeah. It was picking up each side one by one. You know, they weren't on wheels. There was no such thing as wheels. I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> um, and then the vert ramp was the old Hoffman ramp. Yeah. So we yeah. had to like push like five hours or something. To five hours. Yeah. And we have to get inside of it and push our legs like, like like a dog will do against you in the bed, like just kind of push all our legs and arms to try to open it up with five people on the inside while you're using an actual generator. I mean, it was it was insane, uh, pretty embarrassing. But if you're looking at it from just that simple angle, like that was a, uh, it was an interesting time to kind of change and do something. And I think the one thing that no matter what we say about it and how like messed up that industry was, it's a confidence builder. So I learned a lot of important things, but yeah, it all stems from this idea that we're in an industry that pays nothing. The economics are garbage. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're going to be able to even survive, hell of making a big profit, you're going to have to do things really efficiently and really good, right? Mm -hmm. Which is probably not the industry you want to be in for your entire career, but it's a great rumor to step into other things. Um, we talked about like the equipment. I, I tried to redesign and build equipment so that, you know, rather than taking an hour to set up, it would take 10 minutes. Um, so therefore we could do like more events more often, or it was less taxing on the staff. So the, you know, talent would want to come to us instead of other places, et cetera. Um, but those same kinds of things can be applied to, to every industry, really. Um, it was just a, <laughs> as much as we joke about it, how terrible it is. And there's a lot of truth to that. There are some benefits that came from starting there, I think. Yeah, for sure. And I, I completely agree because for me, I know that I wouldn't have learned um all the lessons in business very quickly without that show team. Mm -hmm. because you learn every single lesson very quickly uh for you know my, my first lesson year one was uh have a lot of money in the bank because everything can go fucking wrong <laughs> <laughs> and so you know day it was year one i had just spent you know once again my life savings as well everything i had um had a truck i was driving my truck in new jersey towing the ramps and then my transmission exploded it didn't just go out it exploded <laughs> you know so the transfer case exploded which let go of the drive shaft drive shaft was spinning i remember that yeah took yeah. out the transfer case uh took out the transfer case and then on the way out as it fell it ripped all the lines up <laughs> across the board <laughs> so basically totaled my brand new truck however the way the insurance looked at it the truck was still too expensive because it was a diesel truck. That $20,000 worth of work didn't mean I could total it. So that was a huge lesson I learned very quickly, which was, well, everything can go to shit very quickly. Mm -hmm. You always got to be ready for the worst case scenario, which is if your business is a transportation business, you might have to buy a whole new fucking truck. Yeah. And it did. Yeah. Yep. And you kind of learn those lessons very quickly. And the other thing that was fun, you know, like, I think no matter what we laugh about, about it, like our friends that we hung out with during that time, like those are friends I still have to this day. And I'm sure you do. I know some yeah. work with you yeah. even. So it's like, I know my foundation from BMX is awesome. And I know it also teaches you just like riding in general, teaches you to um, fight for fail. If you fail, you get back up, you do it again. Like that's riding completely. So if you can learn those lessons, especially put it into a business sense and then make a couple bucks doing it in that industry, <laughs> like we always laugh about it. Like, well, it can't be as bad as doing bike shows, which is true. Like, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, there's nothing that's ever going to phase me in any other industry that wants bike shows. You're managing 18 to 20 year old kids. Sometimes, you know, you're your people are on the road with your equipment. You have no uh, communication with them. Back then, it wasn't like I was watching their location or something or making sure they were on time. <laughs> like, we weren't doing any of that. <laughs> it was back, I mean, when I first started doing shows, I actually had a map. So, you know, like all the way back then, and that was when I was managing. So like all the way back then, it's like totally different world. But once again, it's like you learn how to motivate people you learn how to manage people you learn who how to select good people to work with you sure that's probably the hardest thing is selecting good people to actually work with you like 
and then keeping them around. Yeah. Like you still have some around. So while you were doing that, were you starting to get into the real estate business at the same time? Or was uh, that more after? Yeah. So um, we got to the point where we were doing probably 900 shows a year um, with, you know, four or five teams traveling across the country and still basically didn't make any money. Um, although we worked real hard, right? It's just a classic just scenario that people that I would maybe then do too. It's like, oh, I'm not making any money doing 100. I might as well do 900, right? Yep. Um, <laughs> But I, I knew then I was like, I need to switch to a different industry, something that would be, you know, just more well suited to my skill set and my ambitions, et cetera, too. So um, I was very much interested in, in investing and particularly real estate because I like to build things. Hence the reason I was reading mutual funds for dummies, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Starting to understand how that kind of stuff works. But uh, I always knew that if I had, was able to put together enough uh, resources to get started in real estate, I want to show to that instead. And so um, the first time I really made anything of a living in bike riding was after I came to the marketing program um, that, that myself and the business partner and our, our company then uh, offered to the National Guard and paid pretty well. And I was using the bike shows as a, a platform. And, uh, and so I, you know, I made, I think, $100,000 one year, 150, something like that, which is $10 billion in the BMX. And BMX. Right? Yeah, BMX. That's, that's a lot of money. That's, that's like the entire industry yeah. right there. Right? <laughs> Their GDP, <laughs> the GDP of the bike show. Yeah. So, so I, I use that to put the deposit down on a couple of single family houses in Detroit area where I'm from, and and really like thus began my uh, my career in real estate. But from that point on, the follow you know for the next decade, I, I just took the time to really learn and understand all of the fundamentals before I moved into you know the kind of commercial real estate that I'm in now. So I I, I was a student of that industry for 15 years before I really made big moves in it. Nice. So that's, so you're doing the bike shows. Did you feel like it started to get unmanageable to do the bike shows and the real estate all at the same time? Not you weren't, to get you weren't, at that point. Oh, one sec. Uh, yeah. Let me think back. So you weren't actually at the shows much at that point. You were hiring managers to run your teams at that point for the national guard. Yes. So I, uh, this is, kind of the first lesson I learned in how to manage a business from a little bit of a distance or a layer of management, right? So uh, I dropped out of college to go try to ride, ride bikes for a living, started a team, we went through that. Um, handful of years later, though, I was like, eh, maybe I should get back to college. So I enrolled at Penn State, which I lived near there because I was a training facility for bike riding, um, just because I wanted to go and continue learning, right? Mm -hmm. This is three years after I read me cool funds for dummies probably. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but, but I had the choice then. I was like, I either attend class um, in which case I need to hire a manager to manage a, a traveling team remotely, or I, you know, don't pursue educating myself and instead continue traveling and, and being part of the event. Um, so at that point I hired somebody and started trying to manage it remotely. Yeah. Nice. Nice. So you're managing it remotely and that's, that's before you really got the money to do the, uh, real estate projects, right? Oh yeah. That was, that, uh, that was four years before I bought my first property. Okay. Know? So, mm -hmm. so you're, you're, you're there, you're, you have your managers, they're running stuff. But I also do remember plenty of uh, times where I'd be like, Hey, what are you up to? And you'd be like, Hey, I'm flying to Colorado to fix the, uh, <laughs> fix the ramps or something, you know, cause you're, you're a yep. welder. You guys would have welders in the, in the uh, trailers. Yeah. So you would just go out there and fix something, fly home basically. Yeah, so for you know four years or so while I was while I was uh, in college at Penn State, I would go to school during the week, and then a lot of weekends I would travel to either perform or meet a client or weld a ramp in the parking lot broken down in Denver or whatever. Like, nice. yeah, yeah, I did. I did a lot of that. Was hectic years, but formative and, and fun. I enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah, oh, not bad. Yeah, no, I mean that's it's the thing about it. It's like I had a lot of fun doing the show team. I had a lot of fun employing riders. You know, like to me, that was the the biggest thing about it was I got to employ riders, pay them actual money, because really like. At that point, the sponsorship started to really dry up. Mm -hmm. When we were younger, like sponsorship, I remember getting phone calls to put stickers on my helmet for $10,000, $20,000. Now it's like that that would never happen today. No. <laughs> I don't care what type of, you know, people, someone I never got those phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> I, had a couple good years. I had a couple good years of that. Uh, Somebody about to give me some free pants. For yeah. <laughs> I had a couple good years where there was, there was uh, some stickers and some promotions that were ridiculous. Uh, but that was, that was it. Yeah, it was it. But BMX really dried up after that. But it was kind of interesting to see like this the way the sport was at that time, which was if you rode and you were 
riding well, you'd have like Mira or somebody big time sit down with you and be like, this is what you charge. This is what you do. Mm -hmm. And then as the years went on, it became like people just undercut all that. And then they just got whatever money they could. And the next thing you know, they're riding for stickers and t-shirts. Right to the bottom. There's some economic lessons in there. It's like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I compare selling certain types of real estate products, storage units, for example, and I have a built a facility that sells those mm -hmm. uh, to selling green peppers. They're price takers, right? There's no differentiation in the product. And what filtered itself through the BMX industry at first was like, oh, there's there's one or two champions that were well known as so they commanded a price. But then everybody kept on undercutting one another. And it got to the point where who cares? I'm just buying eyeballs with the sticker on the helmet and everything else almost became irrelevant. And so there was no pricing power. Riders undercut themselves and the industry got poorer as a result. <laughs> yes. And that, that happens too with the Instagram thing that kind of happened, which was, you know, I thought it was funny. I watched an interview recently with a rider and he was talking about Instagram killing BMX. And I'm like, he's like, every single time I go ride, I had to film something every single day, you know, mm -hmm. because if you're not on Instagram, if you don't have the biggest following, you don't get sponsors anymore. That I understand, mm -hmm. but also uh, you just got to recognize that if you're going to treat it as a job, that's part of your job. That's part of your job. You know, you can't say, you know, I love being in this industry, but the only part sucks is I got to wake up and go to work every day. Well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it just, it changes things, though. I guess the, it's, it's for the new kids, they're like, this is normal. They grow up doing that. Yeah. For the people who've been around for a long time, like, I couldn't have imagined that would be my job. Like, it was, yeah. back then, it was, we go on road trips, I get um, certain matches if I go on, like, a props trip or something. Mm -hmm. um, things like that were how we got paid, and it was, or video parts, something, get a, a certain percentage of the video, and then contests. Mm -hmm. so there was three aspects now it's like you ride every day you film every single day you film something not to mention the riding what they do ride is very different mm -hmm. like we didn't ride flat rails you know mm -hmm. like that was something that would would have been ridiculous but now there there is something to put out every day like i would have probably killed myself at, at some point if i had done something, <laughs> something good every day yeah but it, it's cool to see the progression in it and the kids now like they all I mean, it's it's wild to me. I couldn't imagine being like, I bunny hops, check out this video. You know, like every single thing they do is filmed from the time they're young all the way till they, they grow up. So it's like a very different uh, world. Glad that they're they're doing that. Glad that it's existing still. I just wish that the race at the bottom wasn't continuing. Like yeah. that sucks because I wish everybody kind of got the same DMX uh, we kind of grew up with, which is not perfect, but I thought it was trending with, different direction than it was today <laughs> yeah i don't pay that much attention to it anymore i'm i'm a fan i follow a few people that i, I like on on the gram right mm -hmm. just because their videos entertain me but the politics the even economics i just i am so crazy yeah. <laughs> you know i don't yeah after you get out of it it's, it's and it's kind of a thing of growing up too for me and i and i see the people that are good friends of mine that are really in it still yeah and i see how much they're hurting sometimes it's something like we we talked about the other day, um, which was the fact that, you know, you're a professional athlete. Yeah. Then you grow up and like, it's totally different things, two totally different things. The adrenaline rush is way different. There isn't at one. <laughs> it's like, it's like, yeah, I've had some pretty crazy days as an entrepreneur. Don't get me wrong, but it isn't like, you know, backflipping over a double or something, you know, yeah. like it's a completely yeah. different adrenaline rush. Um, but if you're kind of, uh, looking at it that way and growing up, I've just seen so many of these people get stuck in like, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I had a buddy of mine, I'm not going to say his name, but I had a buddy of mine, he's like 50 something. He's like, I'm coming back. And I was like, what are you, what are you coming back to? Like, yeah. there's nothing here anyways. Like, but it's like, you get stuck in this um, world of like, I did this, I am this. And why part of the reason why I wanted to talk to you is because like, you've been able to successfully navigate moving into the next step and i've actually never seen or heard you ever say anything about like oh i, I wish i was still doing this or i wish i was doing that do you miss riding these days <laughs> like do you do it's, you think about it at all you just remind me like the first time i think i ever saw you we were at a skate park when i was like 15 years old or 14 or something and you had i think i think you had a bandana on under your helmet and you were i'm sure covered in blood and doing all kinds of awesome stuff and i was like you know one day We'll be having a nuanced conversation about finance because we'll both know from that. It's like right then, it's definitely happens. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, do I miss riding? I I miss. Uh, well, I got back into it in my mid thirties for a few. Had one real hard crash, and I was like, I'm. I'm I remember what I'm doing. Yeah. Um. I. You know. No. No. I do miss some of the feeling it gave me, but I've 
gone on to do other things that that aren't as physically damaging yeah. that I get something of the same thrill from. Business is certainly one of them. You know, you get you, you get something to work toward. You achieve your goals. You can advance. All of these sorts of things. Um, that that's so that that's been something for me. There are others, but yeah, that, I don't miss actually riding anymore. Although I did, you know, appreciate that I got to do that with a chunk of my life. Yeah, it's the same. I, I'm I feel the same way. I don't um because people always call me all the time and they're like like I feel like they're they don't say this but they're like man Jason's totally okay with sucking now you know like I feel like that's that's kind of like the general <laughs> thing like like they'll call me and be like man you know like I don't know how you like do it and like do work and they're like you know like you just, you just don't, don't do it to like that level anymore like, yeah like sometimes I'll go to raise and I'll ride around in circles yeah. and do a couple wall rides but mm -hmm. doing it to that crazy level like I don't feel that I feel the, like I'm missing something. So that was that. And that's why I don't do it at all anymore. Because uh, when I got after like a 10 year or eight year hiatus, I got back into it in my mid thirties. Mm -hmm. And and within a couple months, I was almost as good as I ever was. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but then I, I had those humbling sorts of crashes. And I'm like, okay, it was it was really rewarding to me to know that I can go back and do the same physical things that I did with a little bit of practice. Um, but also, I just came to the realization that like, well, why I'm not working on something. And I, I just think that time is your one finite resource. And if I'm going to be doing something in a way that's like boring to me now, then I'm not going to waste my finite resource on that. Instead, I'm going to go do things that I, I, you know, proactively want to pursue in a meaningful way. And I just don't feel like beating the crap out of myself as bad as it takes to do that. In PMS. No, for sure. And that's the thing. That's also um, when I was younger, I saw Jane Miron. Jamie Ron had a, a conversation, I think he was my favorite rider growing up. And then as he got older, he had some conversation years and years ago about like how he just wouldn't ride if he couldn't do the things he wanted to do. And I thought that was insane. I remember being like, I would always, ride. what are you talking about? Well, you know, it's funny about that example. Look him up on Instagram. Uh, he's an excellent woodworker. Yeah. Right. So like he's, he's found the thing that without destroying his body, he can proactively pursue that way. It captures his imagination, mm -hmm. you know, and, and his work ethic and all of these things. And that's, you know, he, he made a transition to something else that he pursues just as vigorously. So you, cool. you beat my, and that was what I was going to end with. <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, the main point was that, um, you know, you look at someone like Jay Mira and he said like, he couldn't continue to do that. And I, like, I thought that was insane at the time. And now I'm like, I have no interest in doing anything crazy. Like I, I don't want to like get hurt. I remember the last time I hit my head, I was, I was 30, I think early thirties. I hit my head and I was so out of it. And at this time I'm already like running money. I'm in finance. Yeah. Like, it's just like, what in the world am I doing? <laughs> like, I, I can't like have conversations with people. Like, it's like, I can't do that anymore yeah. as much as I love doing it. And it was fun, but it's like, once again, like you said, like, it's, I can't continue yeah. pursuing it. I can't point forward. Like I can't learn anything, but what I can do is what I'm doing now. And that's progression. And the same progression that drives you to, do crazy tricks can be used to anything yeah. like you're you're building businesses now and the same thing that went into writing and learning something new failing figuring it out having something to work towards every day as you said can be something you use now in your business life yeah it's it's you, you might look at a particular thing like our passing on bikes and think that there's not a skill set there that can translate but there absolutely is and i think you're touching down on exactly what that is yeah i think that's it's very important to look at whatever you have in your past as something that can be a skill set mm -hmm. um i see it with addicts all the time like i'll i'll go speak at a rehab center and i'll be like hey you know you can do it and being an addict like you have to sell yourself every day to make money like figure out how you're going to make money every day. Uh, what are you going to sell in your house? Like, what are you going to do? Like, why don't you just do that normally now? Now that you're clean, you could probably do that. <laughs> like, yeah. Maybe you start a business. Maybe you start selling things. Maybe you're the best salesman in the world. Addicts are the best salesman in the world. Like, is having something that you can use as a tool is yeah. really important. So let's hop into the real estate thing now. So now that we're going through, we're, you're writing, that's done. You get into the show team. Then you're getting into, you went to school. By the way, we'll go to that for a second. Okay. How important do you think going to school is? <laughs> did, that, did that help you with anything in your life? <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, of all the investments I've made, and I've made some good ones, real good ones, and some bad ones. By far, the money I spent on college tuition was, and I don't have a degree, mm -hmm. but it was the most 
best investment I've made. Yeah, I, I'm I'm a firm believer in higher education, formal education. Even I don't think that it's a requirement. I think you can get the same knowledge from a book, you know, mm -hmm. or ten cents in library fees or whatever they said in that quote that I'm paraphrasing. But mm -hmm. point is, uh, yeah, I, I I really I believe in education. I don't think that has to happen in a classroom. But for mm -hmm. me, the education I got, in particular to what I do now, was very important. Yeah. Nice. No, I agree. It's um, for me. I don't think formal education is the most important thing in the world, but I think continuing your education yes. is the most important thing. In the world. Always keep learning, mm -hmm. no matter where you're learning from. Just keep learning. Yes, if you're in whatever industry you're in, or whatever. Like I really think that sometimes I think people get too bogged down in like, if I, you know, I have a nephew and he's getting in, interested in real estate and finance. And he's trying to read all these books, and I'm like, you know, maybe read a book that's really weird that you just want to read at first like if you're if you're having trouble reading don't read the hardest thing that you really don't want to read just read something you want to read i remember finding a book called marx and satan and i was like <laughs> what is this and i remember reading that you know like or just like little things at first just to kind of like sp spark your interest and then once you're actually like really in habit of it yeah then it's easy to like read a book a week a book a month whatever you do so uh like an anecdote along these lines the first class i took in college at penn state so my first college class there was uh the introduction to business i thought i was going to be a business major right and i just remember the class being like four to tears at that point i was running my own business so that's what i need to do right i hated it i had to take econ 101 because it was required I immediately fell in love with economics. I'm like, this is, you know, all of a sudden the world makes sense through this mm -hmm. lens to me. Um, and that's what I ultimately majored in there. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Even, and it's the same thing for me. Like, even though I talk, I talk like you, you guys who follow the page, you guys follow everything. I talk a ton about history and economics, a ton about it. However, it doesn't really pertain to trading all the time. Trading is a very different thing. But once again, it's it's um, something that interests me, keeps my brain going, and I fully believe it helps me to see around corners as a trader. Mm -hmm. And same with you, like maybe able to see it around corners as a real estate investor. Sure, right. the economic specifically, you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's, it really is the study of why people and firms make the decisions they do, right? And so it, once you understand that, you can often predict what will happen in a given circumstance, you know, and that's that's how I use it most of the time. And you could not make mistakes. And that's also the thing, like you learn from other people's mistakes. I think that's the best thing I ever got from books. I don't learn books because I, I have so much knowledge and I'm, I'm a fucking genius. I read books because I'm trying to learn like, hey, where did this person go wrong? Like, yeah, there's all the stories about, and I hate them, honestly, especially in finance. Like it's just chest beating. Hey, uh, George Soros shorted the pound like it, right here. And it's like, I like this stuff where he talks about, I'm only right 40% of the time. I yeah. like the stuff where people talk about what they did wrong here. A, there's also a time where Soros was trying to buy the bottom in the crash in 1987 and was losing a ton of money. Yeah. So, I mean, there's all those stories, but to me, like, that doesn't make him a bad trader. He's obviously a very good trader. It's the thing that people miss. It's when you're on Twitter and you're watching all your friends or, like, we were just talking about the crypto people in 2017. I, I made so much money. I made so much money. I promise a lot of them lost a lot of money too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and the thing is to just be open with your mistakes. Like it's okay to just make a mistake, but how do you move on from that? What do you do after your mistake? How do you learn from it? How do you yeah. learn from it? So I love the books that kind of just lay out uh, mistakes. There's a, there's a really good book in finance. I have to look it up because I haven't read it in years, but it was how I lost a million dollars or something. And then there's also the Jesse Livermore book for you guys on here, which is Reminiscence of a Sock Operator which just goes through his whipsaw of all life. I mean, the guy made a ton of money. He shorts crashes. He makes all the money in the bull markets. Then he loses everything by doing such a dumb mistake. Uh, the crash of 1929 happens. He shorts the market. He's actually like made more money than he ever did in his life. A few years later, he's broke and he kills himself in a hotel. I mean, it's, it's wild. Like, but it's the reminiscence of a stock operator. It's a really good book on the story and Jesse Livermore. But, um, but yeah, so now let's get into real estate. So what all do you invest? In? I'm just uh, amazed. You might have probably the most well-read person I know. And I think that's really like. I read too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't say that and I would disagree with it. But, um, you know, what do I invest in in real estate? I, you know, I've, I've done, I don't say everything, but I've done like, you know, several asset classes. I've done 
a wide variety of things within real estate. What I specialize in these days is adaptive reuse of like blighted commercial property, something where I think it can be turned into something that's uh, just a new highest and best use. Yeah, you know, productive when it's not. I, I don't. I don't typically buy like the, you know, there's the Walgreens and they pay the rent and I understand that stuff. But to me, it's like, okay, well, what's, you know, what about this problem property that could be really cool? And what, what does it take to get there? And, you know, what are we going to do with it? That's, that's what I try to focus on. Nice. So, if, so it doesn't matter exactly. You, you invest in commercial, you invest in residential. Yeah. I, I don't do single family houses anymore. Uh, that's where I started. And the reason being, it has to do with the difference between commercial and residential finance, which we can talk about, but, but really at its core is that in residential finance, you, your cap rate you can sell. Your, what, what the value of the asset is based on is what the next homeowner paid. Mm -hmm. And so the whole residential game in single family is to buy it as cheap as you can, put as little as you can into it so you can make a profit, right? Mm -hmm. There's no opportunity to say, well, what if we repurpose this house into something else? You know, create something that's good for the community that'll increase cash flows. Therefore, that value of asset goes up. So it might make sense to invest a little more, do something better. Not the case with single family. And so I don't really do that much. Anymore. Yeah. Instead, I try to focus on things where, okay, well, where can we have an impactful difference on whatever we're working on? Yeah. And I, I think the thing that's also important, if you've ever been to uh, Rob's Town in Wyandotte, Michigan, like there's buildings for uh, that you are a part of, like all over the city. Um, you're also getting another building down the street. And was this one of your first commercial properties? This this one we're in was my first commercial was property. It? Yeah, okay. it, it sort of kind of ties together here. I bought this building that we're sitting in today, uh, 6,600 square foot, um, two story, mostly the first story though, uh, because I, I wanted an office in our downtown. I was working from home in my bedroom at the time. And uh, and we were getting ready for to serve as our National Guard contract that I thought we were going to win. Right. And uh, so this is for the bike riding stuff. Mm -hmm. And I wanted a place for people to work for me to work. Um, so I bought this building to use a chunk of it for that. And then the rest was just going to continue to be leased to the people who live here or, or work here. And uh, and then I lost the contract. Right. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's when I decided I'm, I didn't want to be in that industry anymore anyway. So the timing was good. But I said, yeah. okay, well, I have this building now and no identified end use in my mind. What am I going to do with it? So I repurposed it into uh, kind of like a shared office concept for most of it and coffee shop, a couple of apartments upstairs. Um, so at that point, I applied what I've been studying for a long time in my first kind of commercial real estate endeavor. Nice. Oh, that's cool. And it, it's, um, I think it's really um, interesting because it's a, like, when you're growing your finances, there's very easy ways to do things. Uh, I just stuff money here. I continue to stuff money here. Or you can kind of like be like, hey, I this is my business here. Hey, this is good for the community here. Um, how do I get flows out of also bring yeah. it out? Well, I, so I never, um, because I'm not in like money management, right. And, and so I never had money where I could park it and earn a return. Like that wasn't like that. That's not what my industry is or my background. And so for me, it very much was a question of, okay, what else do I bring to the table? How do I leverage, you know, my skills, which at the time were understanding real estate finance or construction into something that can create value for myself, if that makes sense. So I took what resources I had at the time and, and put in a lot of sweat equity to start here at this point. <laughs> but yeah, so now that we're in the commercial real estate part, now you're in, so you have this building, you have one down the street that's kind of similar. And then what about the new project you're we're working on now? Like I'm also interested yeah, in it. Yeah, so that, that's, that's an adaptive, it's, it is the thing that I'm saying that we do, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's an adaptive reuse of an existing building. So that's the former city hall building here in town um, that, that I bought to turn into like a mid-rise building with apartments and some commercial use to it. But it's the same thing. It's the, uh, you know, will this project change the community? Can we, can we improve it in a way that's going to, you know, generate value? Not only value for us as investors, but value for the area, right? That, that, in my mind, that's how real estate works best. You know, you create value for yourself as an investor by creating something that other people want to financially participate in, mm -hmm. um, be it through tenants or as an investment or or whatever. And so that's that's the opportunity that we look for. Yes, yeah. I think most of the time for me when I'm investing with somebody, because if I'm throwing somebody six figures, most of the time it's because I'm invested in that person. Sure. Yeah. And you yeah. being you being that person, like number one is like, yes, you're absolutely right. You have to. That's why it's annoying when people talk about business uh, business owners all being terrible. It's like you have to create value to get value. Like yeah. you can't just 
create nothing that's crap and be yeah. like, here you go. You you can. There are yeah. people who do it, but they go out of business pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think for for you, you've always uh, the one thing your projects you always do well on. You've always been a good person, at least to me. You've always been. <laughs> I try. I, I, other people would disagree. <laughs> I'm sure there's been somebody that's going to write in the comments about me being an asshole, <laughs> me being an asshole. I'm sure that that's going to. Uh, and they may have a fair point. But yeah, that's yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, but once again, it's uh, generally like you've done very like you were always a good mentor to me because you were always kind of the guy who did try to do the right thing if you could and that's what i've always tried to do like you know the, there's plenty of times in the show industry where we've done shows and like somebody's argued about something stupid yeah i remember one time we did a show and i brought a ton of riders because i wanted to make a splash it was like a local event mm -hmm. so i brought a ton of riders thought this event was really really cool put it all together um at the end of it the guy was like man that was a great show but like it was short i was like what do you mean he was like it was only 35 minutes and i was like the contract says 30 minutes right up right, 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 right here it's 30 minute shows we can do three in a day but it's 30 minute shows mm -hmm. and he was like oh, i just can't i just can't do it but once again it's like I, I tried to do the right thing yeah. hey it's fine we'll meet in the middle yeah. here you know shave something off riders being in bad situations like paying them a little bit more getting stuck somewhere when we're not sure. making any more money sure. like we we don't make more money when the, the stuff breaks down we actually make a lot less money but yeah. trying to do things like that has always been something you've done and i think that's that's a good thing and once again it's like people will always be mad because when you get to a certain area like i don't know if people tell me i don't somebody told me the other day i don't do enough for bmx and it's like what do you what do you want me to invest in it like what do you, <laughs> what do you want you know like it's like i don't i don't know but once again it's like a i think anybody who really knows you like it's a different thing. yeah um and it's important to also like when you're when you're a new company or you're taking on a new project you really are selling yourself yeah your ability to do things so to end off um What's something you would tell your younger self? You're sitting there, you're reading mutual funds for dummies. Uh, <laughs> what's something you would tell like somebody who's first getting into investing and starting to enjoy this uh, part of the business? And what like uh, what would you tell? Always continue learning. You know, uh, just whatever whatever it is that you think you want to do. And I've gone through several things um, myself. Just dive into it. You know, 100. percent Learn everything you can about whatever that is. You know, be it real estate or investing or stocks or hedge funds or even bike show teams, right? Like if you just, if you just really dive into what you're trying to do and learn to understand everything about it, one, you're going to be better at that and more effective, but two, you're also going to learn a bunch of lessons you can take with you as you go on to do other things. Nobody's static, at least nobody that's successful, I think is static and you just, you got to constantly adapt, but as long as you just really dive into what's in front of you and, and work at it and more than anything else, learn. You'll, you'll be fine no matter what direction you point it you know no i love that it's uh that's one thing that i've always like it, it's as the years went on i'm comfortable with it um but i know people around me my whole life have been like you change like your what you're doing every other day you know yeah <laughs> and it's like my focused learning is is just everywhere it's all over the mm -hmm. place always but once again like for me it connects it all connects to whatever i'm doing most of the time and then also, like like you said, like diving in, figuring it out. Like the most important part of being an entrepreneur is being able to put your whole life into it. Like, mm -hmm. like it's it's hard. It's not always fun. There's times, periods that are terrible. There's times that are awesome. But understanding like those bad times usually lead to good times and good times can lead to bad times at times. Yeah. But just as long as your ability to stay focused you're going to do well. Well, and, and where opportunity is changes too. I mean, so, you know, sometimes it might be for you commodities. I'll, I'll say these things poorly because I'm not an expert in what you're an expert at. Other times it might be some other assets. Um, in real estate, it might be a certain, you know, in, in 2009, the best thing you could do was buy a house in Detroit, right? Because they were 10 cents and that was going to go up and nobody had a crystal ball in you for sure. Um, but that now is a very hard area to, to make a living in. Um, but real estate itself isn't just as stocks and hedge funds and that sort of thing. It's not. So it's like if you, if you are adaptive and you do continue to learn, and it's also going to help you in addition to be more effective today, see where the next opportunity might be and start to, you know, work toward it with time. We'll, we'll, we'll end on that. I'll just cut it there. Okay.